mama talked to me in last night and gave me some good advice. But son, you ought to quit. You're rambling all around. Marry a sweet loving wife. Cause there's more pretty girls than one. More pretty girls than one. And any that I ramble all around in there's more pretty girls than one Today we're talking about a Tony Rice rhythm trick that you probably heard before, but you don't have a name for. This is something that I talked about recently in a live stream when a mod of mine asked about Tony Rice style rhythm tricks. By the way, live streams, Tuesday, 6 p.m. Eastern time, be there. A couple of disclaimers, I'm not trying to copy all of Tony's rhythm style. In fact, in that little intro segment, I really didn't play rhythm like Tony Rice at all. I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to talk about this one trick, which I did include over and over and over again in the rhythm example in the intro. Also, I know that there's a lot of folks that are new to Bluegrass that watch my channel. So if you don't know who Tony Rice is, Tony Rice is kind of the guy. Um, when we think about progressive bluegrass guitar. Um, there's sort of this pre-Tony Rice and post-Tony Rice. And post-Tony Rice, uh, it's kind of an anything goes world. Uh, Pre-Tony Rice, there's much more uh, traditionalism. We think of maybe players more like Doc Watson. If you don't know any of those names, just ask some questions in the comments and I'm sure people in the community would be happy to give you a bunch of guitar players that you should listen to if you haven't listened to a lot of bluegrass before. What we're doing, first of all, is we're implying new chord changes. And why would we do that? <laughs> well, a lot of times you can simulate more movement between chords. It might make the chord progression feel more satisfying, like, uh, like a bigger resolution has occurred maybe the one that actually did. And bluegrass musicians actually do this all the time. I mean, what we're talking about today gets a little weird, but in a very basic sense, bluegrass musicians do this a lot. For instance, we would put a dominant seventh chord in between two other chords. So here's the example. Let me back this up with some theory. You have a G chord going to a C chord. Now the relationship from G to C is five and one, as in C would be one and G would be five, right? And that five to one relationship means that they really want to resolve to each other. Five really wants to go to one. Because of that, I can not just have G going to C, I can have G, G7, C. Even in a given song, this might not be the actual five chord going to the one chord. It could be just a simulated relationship. For instance, G going to C has a five to one relationship, right? C, D, E, F, G, G is five, C is one. But in the same song, I might have a D chord going to G. And when D goes to G, I have the same relationship. G, A, B, C, D, D is five, G is one. So I should be able to go D, D7, G. So I'll be in Paris on the mountainside. I wondered when I was alive. Yeah, good. All of those feel. Now, Tony Rice takes this another level. He's not just implying seven chords. He's actually implying chords that have an extended, more interesting harmony. First of all, let's try to visualize what that harmony is. So what we need first is we need a big old major scale. I'm gonna make one change to this major scale though. When we make these dominant chords, they always have the flat seven. So it's gonna be the major scale. But instead of the major seven, I'm gonna have the dominant seven. That's technically the Mixolydian mode, but the, you know, nerd stuff, we don't need that right now. So let's pull up that scale chart. This is what it looks like. Once again, applying numbers to all the notes in the scale, right? I would have one, two, three, four, five, six, flat seven. This is G again. This would normally be one again, but if we continue the numbering, I would have eight, nine, 10, 13, I guess flat 14, which is funny to say, and 15. Uh, we never use some of those numbers and you'll see why. So if I want a chord that's got more extended harmony than just a seventh, for instance, instead of G7, what if I want G9 or G11 or G13? You see these chords with these big numbers. Basically what's being applied here is that I have the normal root third and fifth of the original chord. Then I have the seventh, and then I'm counting up to whatever number I may have next. So visualizing like a big old G13 chord 
looks like this. So I've taken my scale and I've crossed out the numbers that don't help me build the chord now. So I have one, three, five, flat seven, nine, 11, 13. Now I can't hold down all of the <laughs> notes to make this chord. Um, I can't even really hold down most of them. This isn't how I would probably play this voicing, but I can give you a taste of it. it might be something like this. Right, and you can tell that's a big old chord with a bunch of interesting harmonies on it, right? You can also see in the way that this is written why we don't use some of those numbers, right? I could never have the 15 chord, because if you remember 15 was just G again. It's not a new note, it's not an interesting note. Um, all of the odd numbers tend to be the interesting notes, so I can really only have G7, G9, G11, or G13. That's kind of how extended harmony works. Anyway, that's the quick explanation. Let's move on to some interesting chord shapes though, because that's what this whole thing is really about. So there's a couple ones that work really well for this Tony Rice style trick, and the first one is probably my favorite one. Um, it's not everyone else's favorite, <laughs> at least I don't think, but it's one of my favorites. And it sounds like this. we talked about what this is, it's a G11 chord, basically. You could call it some different things, maybe you could analyze that harmony differently if you wanted to, but to me it's a G11. Um, so when I'm playing, I got ring finger on that low G note, I'm deadening the A string, no sound, open D, open G, and then first fret on B and E. Right, so these two fingers aren't really doing anything, they're just in the way. I just have my bass note, and then uh, first fret on B and E. That's a chord. You can hear it in, in a lot of Tony Rice tunes. Now where you would put this in a chord change is the exact same place that you would put um, a G7 chord, right? So I have. Right? It's a cool sound. But Tony tends to not keep the same rhythm pattern going. He tends to make it more interesting. And one of the ways he does that is with this little hiccup feeling. Um, and it's just a bass note, and then immediately catching the upstroke strum. Sounds like this. And when we're playing it this slow, it sounds like night moves. Um, we don't want it to sound like night moves. So if I speed it up, Idea. So he'll do that same thing in, in other keys or in other situations, right? And the two other shapes are really similar. One of them is essentially a C11 shape where you're barring just a bunch of this here. Um, there is another way that he'll do this. He sometimes plays B flat chord, but we're gonna come back to that. We're gonna come back to that. Um, right, you can play this big old C11, which I did in my beginning in my More Pretty Girls Than One, but it's essentially the same trick. Right? Going from C to F this time, right? Feel free to use the oven mitt. The oven mitt, great way to play that chord. <laughs> Same sound, same situation, just different chord shape. The other one that he'll use is a D9, so we're not getting the 11th this time, but it's like this. Actually, I'm using the open D string. And then I'm barring with fret here. A lot of times he'll do it with his pinky too. Same move, same trick. This is probably uh, the most common place that he'll do it. Sometimes he does it with a different rhythm pattern which we will also talk about. But uh, those are the three big chord shapes. If you just wanna immediately pop this into the key of G, the key of C, the key of D, or sort of these common uh, chord changes, that's how you would do it. Those are the shapes. G11, C11, D9. 
I think one of the interesting things about this is that to me, these are kind of like one off voicings and opportunities like they you can find other voicings for these chords. It's a million voices for, you know, G11, but, uh, but they don't really feel like Tony Rice because they're not the ones that Tony played. Um, if you can at least get them similar to the voicings that Tony used, it feels a lot more like you're evoking that sound. If you're using completely different voicings, you don't really get that sound. So you can't really approach this like a like a jazz musician or something because Tony Rice wasn't a jazz musician. So if you hunt for all the different voicings, you're not going to get, you know, like bonus Tony Rice sounds. Tony never used those sounds. Um, it's kind of a tough situation if you're if you're looking for more. They feel like one off tricks and stunts and they kind of are. God, I can only do this like here, here and here for it to feel like Tony. It's kind of true. So now that now that you've seen all those examples, maybe we should analyze our application really quick because I think that this is important. What we're doing is we're essentially doing a basic boom chuck, right? And at some point we're including that hiccup, right? And then we're going, uh, instead of going straight back to the boom chuck, we're putting a rhythm push. And it kind of has a, a feeling like a drum fill. This is the standard drum beat. This is like the surprising fill. I like, oh, what happened? And then this is like the crash symbol. So they're set up to be like a small drum fill that a drummer might do. I mean, if you try to implement them in any other way, sometimes they feel forced or they don't really do what you expect them to. That is the easiest way to execute and have it come out successfully. So I did mention that there is another rhythm that Tony will use. Uh, when he does that that hiccup portion, right? He essentially creating a longer drum fill. And that's what I like to call the Salt Creek rhythm. You ever play the B part Salt Creek, right? You got this. It's like down, up, up, down. Right, that Salt Creek rhythm, Tony will use that when he plays his like G11 chord. And I used that in the beginning of my More Pretty Girls Than One a second ago in the intro. Um, that's my beginning. Oh, pretty girls than one. The interesting thing about extended harmony is that right now we're keeping uh, essentially the bass note the same. Saying, hey, this is still a G chord, but it's got all these other notes in it. So it's G11 now. It's still a C chord. It's got all these other notes in it. It's C11 now. It, it doesn't have to work that way. Um, you could kind of change your perspective and these could just be other major chords. So for instance, this chord, if I change the root note to F, suddenly it's sharing a lot in common with just F major. And this could be some other, you know, major seven, uh, suspended, you know, uh, add six kind of chord situation, which is a pretty chord and it, it would be cool to include. I think I did do a little bit of that in the recording. Ultimately, it's kind of just the other major chord too, right? So instead of going G, G7, C, I could just do G, F, C. Which is quite literally night moves. And that, that trick, that trick is actually an even older trick. That's something that we see George Shuffler do in breaks like Worried Man Blues. You know, everyone discovers the same thing. Nothing is new, nothing is sacred, yada, yada, yada. For the other chord shapes, there's other similar ones. So for the C11, it could have just been B flat, which is something that we see Tony Rice do in Church Street Blues. And for the D chord, it could just be C major. Um, which is something that happens naturally in the chord changes in Old Train. Old Train. Blow. If you think about it, that could have been some interesting chord too. Oh, train, I can hear your whistle blow. The D9 fits there, <laughs> even though it's supposed to be C major, the D9 would kind of do that job too. There are some other examples of Tony using these cool chords. I'm trying to think of a couple off my head. One of them would be the Tony Rice chord change, uh, which is this. A lot of times it's simplified to just F, C, G. Because uh, normally that's what you can't hear, but a lot of times he's still playing this suspended, interesting G11 kind of chord. Um, and he'll do that at the end of at the end of a break, you know. <laughs> and 
And that's just that G11, C, and then G. It's another cool Tony trick that's kind of just adjacent to the one that we just talked about. It's very similar. Anyway, I know that we're just hanging out and we're talking about chords and how Tony Rice uses them, but I hope these little uh, voicings that I've given you and this rhythm context that I've given you helps you structure those. Remember that the gimmick is kind of that you're setting it up like a drum fill. And if you remember that boom chuck going to the hiccup, whatever kind of maybe Salt Creek rhythm or just the down up, and then going to the rhythm push, which is essentially like the crash on beat one, that solves your whole problem, right? Then you just have to make sure that the chord you're doing the hiccup with is an interesting chord, G11, C11, D9, all being good examples of things that Tony would actually do, but you could probably come up with a new chord even. That stuff that I showed you later on was just for fun, you know that. Anyway, you can check out the tab store and I think I'm gonna put the tab from this lesson up there so you can grab that for sure. Live streams always Tuesday, 6 p.m. Eastern time. Um, merch, Skype lessons, articles, all at the website. Please check it out. Um, and that's all I got. So I will just see you next time. See y'all later. Midnight train, spell her